Um, welcome to this Vantage Point 3 webinar. We're going to go ahead and get started here um, as we begin. I just have a few things I'd like to encourage you um, just to let you know about. Uh, today our, our topic is Crucibles, Times of Disorientation in a Leader's Life. And if you've uh, lived life any length of time or certainly been a leader for any length of time, you know that there's been times of confusion or disorientation. And uh, I think today you'll be um, blessed by some of the information and, and content that will be given. Uh, I think it will give you a framework to help identify what those seasons look like, but also ways in which God can use those, uh, those times in our lives and in the people that we are seeking to uh, lead as well as we develop others. But uh, let me just encourage you as we begin. Um, welcome to all of you friends and uh, maybe new friends of Vantage Point 3. Uh, I know that from my perspective and, and certainly from Rob and Randy's, we would probably all prefer just sitting across the table and having a, a cup of coffee with you and having conversation uh, that way. But uh, we know that that's uh, not necessarily possible, and we are kind of new to this technology, but uh, we do want to make it conversational if possible. We would love to uh, have your questions um, come to us, and you can do that on the, on the dashboard, your control panel that is uh, near you, and at the end of our broadcast, towards the end, we'll be taking uh, questions and giving some answers, a Q&A time. And so I w would just encourage you to look there. If you've got a question that comes to mind, uh, don't be afraid to send that our way. Um, also, we want you to just relax and enjoy this next uh, hour or so. Um, you don't need to take notes. Uh, just, just enjoy being a part of this uh, together. Um, it is being recorded, and so in the next day or so, you'll receive an email that will give you a link to our web page and a place where you can go if you want to access the information again. You can do that. You can download it. And so we don't want you to uh, feel like you you need to take notes, but uh, you will have uh, the opportunity to, to get the information if you'd like. Well, let's begin. And I just want to welcome you friends and uh, maybe new friends of Vantage Point 3. Uh, let me introduce who we are a little bit. Um, as, a, as an organization, uh, Vantage Point 3 really is uh, committed to the, the idea of fostering depth and um, kingdom empowerment in the, in the local church and other ministry contexts. We provide transformative processes that help people discover in a deeper, deeper way who God is, who they are, and what God desires to do through them. And those, really, those three questions kind of uh, give us our name, Vantage Point 3. But let me introduce myself, and then I'm going to introduce Randy and Rob as well. Let them introduce themselves. Um, my name is Brian Stainhook, and I'm uh, my role here at Vantage Point is advancement. And to be honest with you, uh, I'm kind of surprised today that they let me uh, host this thing. That I'm the one uh, <laughs> trying to keep this uh, together, but uh, it, it will be a little fun uh, with these guys and. Uh, Randy and Rob are going to serve as panelists uh, for us, and uh, they're going to be giving us lots of good stuff uh, to, to think about and chew on. But let me uh, hand it over to them. Uh, Randy, if you'd introduce yourself first, and then Rob. Sure. Thanks, Brian. Good to be with you all. Uh, as we look at the guest list here, it is quite a crew. Uh, we could have a good time if we had a big pot of coffee together. So, so we'll <laughs> go with this format for now, but someday we will be together. So I'm Randy Reese, uh, president of Vantage Point 3. Have been uh, doing this now for about a dozen years, and uh, uh, it's felt at times like there have been disorienting times uh, as we've been keeping our hand to this plow, and yet uh, uh, far greater than that, this has been a rich blessing and uh, a privilege that the Lord has given me to uh, just to be a part of this ministry. So Rob, over to you. Uh, my name's Rob. Good to be together with you three uh, and the rest of the group here. Uh, I work with VP3 in the area of education, um, thinking through the processes we do as well as um, really thinking through how we invest in, and facilitate deeper conversations. I um, live in Sioux Falls uh, here, but spend a good bit of my time prior to Sioux Falls and working with Vantage Point 3 uh, in Southern California. And, uh, 
So, yeah, I'm excited too about our topic. Uh, this has played such a critical role in my own life uh, as I look back these sorts of disorienting times as I have some perspective on it. But um, yeah, it's gl I'm glad to be with you all today. Thanks, uh, Randy and Rob. Yeah, let's uh, get right into what we are hoping to talk about today. Our really our concern are a couple things. Um, these seasons of disorientation and maybe uh, giving some tools in which we can identify what those look like. And then also their role in our development and uh, particularly as leaders, maybe uh, what, how they would affect our role uh, in developing others, how we can pay attention to others and maybe the kinds of seasons uh, that they're going through. And so, uh, yeah, Rob, why don't you take it from here? Sure. Let me, let, me, uh, let me pray for us kind of as we uh, get going here. Um, so, uh, Father, we thank you. We recognize even in this format uh, we are not talking behind your back, but you're among us in this conversation. And uh, may it be a, a gift um, to others in, in terms of those even walking through times where life just doesn't seem to be making sense, as well as uh, for those of us that are walking with others through difficult times. Uh, may we learn to trust you more deeply. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me just start right off the bat, just as, as best we can, kind of defining our terms. What do we mean by these times of disorientation? Uh, we certainly all have a sense when we see that, but uh, an, an easy sort of definition that uh, I kind of use for this is they are these uh, periods of time in our lives when life just seems to stop making sense, or making sense the way we've known it. Um, and uh, as a consequence, uh, you know, some of those words up there that you're even seeing on the screen begin to characterize our experience. In one sense or another, uh, we felt at home, we felt oriented, we felt a sense of equilibrium, but then something happens, or a set of circumstances occurred, and there's a disruption. And uh, this equilibrium is broken. It's, uh, there's a loss of order, uh, and somehow or other, we feel like we've lost our way. Uh, that's what we mean by these times of disorientation. Um, emotionally, you can see those words. Uh, I would add a few to the bewildered and perplexed that for some of us in these times, emotionally, they're, they're, we're full of hurt, uh, anguish. Uh, I think characterizes it, disillusionment for people. And when you're walking with someone or you are that person that you've entered into this disorientation, one of the, the sure ways you know you're in it is you don't even know how to talk about where you are. And, uh, and so historically within the church, people have used language like a desert, and there's obviously a number of different deserts, but uh, that characterizes it well. Um, most recently, I, I was doing some reading in a book that we'll refer to a couple times by a gentleman named Robert Thomas, uh, wrote, wrote Crucibles in Leadership, hence the title we're using today. And one of the most helpful things he did is break down three kind of major types of these disorientation, because I think sometimes we put them all together. And so what, what I'd like to do is just walk real briefly through uh, these three types that he talks about and see where you resonate um, with this in your own experience. Uh, the first type has the character of disorientation, has the character of a new new territory. Um, I think of this as it's kind of a walking off the map. Uh, we've come into a period in our life in which what we know of who God is and who we are and what God might be asking us to do no longer kind of seems adequate, and, and we're being challenged to move into some unfamiliar places. Uh, in all of this, there's kind of the echo of um, Abraham in that Genesis 12 kind of signature kind of invitation to leave the familiarities of Ur to go to a place that I will show you. And uh, this sort of disorientation uh, has that sort of um, unknown fear, um, Sometimes it's a job transition and you're being given a new set of responsibilities and, and all of a sudden uh, you realize that um, you, you can't get by with what you already knew. 
and uh, can be very uh, disoriented, exciting sometimes for some of us, but also very fearful um, uh, as we go. I mean, I think of some friends a few years ago who went on the Peace Corps uh, to Western Asia for two years, and there's no other word for what that two years did in their own journey, uh, but that it was disorienting and they had walked completely off the map asking significant questions about who the guy is and whether they can trust him and things like that. So that's the first, uh, according to Thomas, the, the first element. Uh, the, the other way of thinking about, another way of thinking about disorientation is that of reversal. Okay, these are the ones that immediately come to mind, uh, profoundly painful times when like, it seems as if the legs have been knocked out from under us. Loss, failure, a rejection, a broken relationship, uh, very much they have a before and after sort of character, such as um, before mom had cancer, after mom had cancer, uh, before I was fired, after I was fired, uh, before our daughter um, came down with leukemia, after our daughter came down with that uh, before the divorce, after the divorce. Very, very painful, anguished times in which uh, they really challenge us uh, to hold on to what's true in the world. Everything seems a bit upside down. Um, the Psalms seem full of these moments uh, in which the psalmist is experiencing this sort of reversal uh, in the story. Uh, all that they know to be true is challenged. Um, and so many times these are the ones, I mean, I can think in my own life uh, in the early 90s, reversal is exactly the, the characteristic. Uh, it felt as if one day, I'd been, my whole life I'd been on a Monopoly board, I understood how to play, I knew the rules of the game, and I woke up the next morning through a series of events, um, and it felt like I was on a shoots and ladders board, and all the rules had changed. Uh, I was yearning for a jail or something, and all I was hitting was these chutes and ladders, and very, very disorienting. So there's uh, reversal in addition to the uh, new territory. And, and then the third element of, or type of disorienting time is suspension. Uh, and what we mean by this, the character of this is kind of a holding pattern. Uh, some people feel as if things happen in their life in which they get put on the bench extended times of deliberation and waiting. They may not have the sudden character of change, of reversal. Um, sometimes they're, they're voluntary. We, we, we recognize that the Lord's leading us into somewhere and we, we step, we put ourselves on the bench or step back for an extended time of asking and discerning. Um, other times it's not voluntary, it's a job loss. Um, we often, in walking with people, that walk through our emerging journey process, we often notice people ha entering times like this that are in the half time, to, bo to borrow Bob Buford's phrase, searching for to move beyond success to significance. They enter these times when life just doesn't seem to make sense. The rules have changed a bit, uh, and these two can be full of uh, fear and, Lord, where are you taking me, and, and lots and lots of waiting. So these three uh, seasons of disorientation, uh, by no means do I want to kind of make these as hard, rigid categories. Uh, obviously, we have experiences in our life in which we may participate in all three of these elements. But there are other times where it's really helpful to, to recognize that, um, the, to name some of the, the type of experience we're having, whether we're in a bit of a holding pattern in our journey, uh, or at other times when the legs have just frankly been completely knocked out from under us, or whether we're walking kind of off the map. Each of them are very disruptive um, sorts of times. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, I think that's a very helpful kind of summary. And I think it might be a good time to um, transition and, and kind of uh, engage everyone. We'd like to... Uh, invite you to respond to a poll question that we put together. Um, and really, the poll question is this, which of these three experiences, um, 
most resonates with your own journey or experience. And the way you might think about that is um, maybe you're currently in a time or a season of disorientation, um, or you, you've come out of that and, and you've experienced something uh, like this. And, and so if you're close to the computer, um, if you could respond to that, that would be great. We'd love to see um, kind of where you are as a group and kind of where you're uh, experiencing. We're seeing some, some results in that. And Randy, let me just ask you a question while the results are coming in. Sure. Um, sometimes, um, you know, as we think about this disorienting time, uh, it can come off as almost dark and fearful time. But uh, you had a, an interesting comment that I think uh, we should hear. That doesn't yeah. have to be that. Right. And oftentimes, the first things we think about are those dark or heavy or um, times where we feel like we've lost our way as those that are disorienting. And yet, for some of us, uh, for us to walk off the map into new territory, man, it, that grinds our coffee beans, and we can't wait to get at that sort of thing. So uh, it can also be uh, an exciting time, a life-giving time, a hopeful time. Uh, and the word that comes to mind is uh, perspective. How do we have perspective given all that's happening around us? So it makes sense that we can't really go with this thing alone. I uh, Just a quick story. I, I took my horse yesterday, selling my horse. <laughs> People told me horses were a lot of work. I finally clued into that. Uh, so I took my horse to this place. And now my horse has attitude. She's got a lot of horsepower, so to speak. Uh, she's part thoroughbred, has attitude. And I took her to this place that is this phenomenal horse ranch. Now, we are not a phenomenal horse ranch by any means. We got this old shed that the horses can go in when it's cold. But when I took her into this new elaborate barn, uh, she was freaked out. And she kept prancing in the pen and uh, uh, making all sorts of noises because she didn't want to be there. And yet, it was a much greater place for her to be. Now, I knew perspective-wise that was going to be a better place for her to be. But while she's going in it, it was a very disorienting time for her. And sometimes we're like that. We can, <clears throat> the Lord is actually leading us to a better place, and we might even be in it, and yet uh, all within us is just one big place of anxiety. We, we have, a, I think, a helpful comment here that, that um, I think is, is true. There's a sense of loss of control seems to be a common characteristic of all of them. Yeah. That's right. And uh, yeah, how would you know? How would you respond to that? Is that? Yeah, I think that's spot on. When we, when we don't have a sense of control of things for any of us, it it kind of rocks our world. And so we kind of we grapple toward how do we regain a sense of control? Or Rob's definition earlier. Uh, I mean, we clamor for life to make sense, and when it doesn't, it confronts us with all sorts of things. You, you guys will see the results. I, if you notice that, the new territory, 45% in reversal, 16 and suspension, 39%. So there's a uh, certainly that new territory. And obviously, there's overlap to all those sorts of times. But mm -hmm. yeah, that each of these, and, and maybe that will even uh, get to our sort of move us on to our uh, next kind of dynamic is. Uh, they have a, it seems like each of these sorts of times ha have the possibility of not only being disruptive, but being invitational too. And that, I think that's what we, our heart is to lean into some of stretching our imagination to see them that way. Um, yeah, so why don't we move on with that then. Uh, what is the role of these disorienting times in, in a leader's development? And Randy, would you speak to that? Sure. You know, Brian, I think, uh, I know for me and my hunches uh, for others, our knee-jerk reaction is to get out of it, to try to quickly figure it out, or to uh, yeah, try to right. remake sense of it. And at times, we simply can't. And so how can we enter these times knowing that they have a, a significant value? And especially as we walk alongside others, for some of us, uh, we are wired in a way where we love walking alongside others. And if we have eyes to see people in seasons of disorientation, it's like we show up to work then. 
and we know that that's the time when there's something for us significantly to pay attention to. So uh, one way to look at it as seasons of disorientation are heightened times of learning and development. Uh, one person uh, that Rob mentioned earlier, Robert Thomas, we would really encourage you to uh, grab a copy of his book if you don't already have it, Crucibles of Leadership, and read through that. Uh, but there's a great quote there that uh, we want to show you and uh, give some thought to. Yeah, let me just go ahead and read that. Um, in medi medieval times, it was the vessel in which alchemists attempted to turn base metals into gold. In leadership context, we think of a crucible as transformative, a transformative experience from which a person extracts his or her gold, a new or altered sense of identity. Crucibles are more like trials or tests that corner individuals and force them to answer questions about who they are and what is really important to them. Hmm. Yeah, yeah that, I think we could all just sit on a rock and extract several things from that. One yeah, of the, I would, uh, even Randy, I would even add, as he at, as, ends that, those three questions of ours, who is God, uh, who am I, identity, and kind of kingdom responsibility, what does God desire to do, it, it seems like it forces us to answer questions about those three at different levels, but that came to mind as I was reading that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, many of you know that a person that has been uh, dear to us and has influenced how we think and practice what we do is J. Robert Clinton from Fuller Seminary. Clinton's study of uh, leaders along the way, uh, those who finished well, those who didn't fell, finish well, when they hit these times of uh, crucible, or as he calls them, boundary times, there were certain learnings that were prominent. And, uh, and you may find yourself in one or more of these particular learnings as I go through them. So in other words, <clears throat> that we might call this, uh, so what? of these crucible times, or so what, of these disorienting times, can we, uh, can we learn to see their value and what we might learn from them? So for some of us, the first one is uh, right where we find ourselves, that we are being invited into a deepened relationship with God. A few weeks ago, I was with a friend in Canada, and uh, Brad, who is a pretty successful leader in his own right, a lot of responsibility. Uh, he knows the ropes with spiritual disciplines. He knows how to get things done. Uh, probably in his mid-40s-ish, uh, he's wrestling with a question. And uh, his question is, uh, how do I find God again amidst all of, of this success? Yeah. And he is smack dab in the middle of a significant crucible time. Uh, so for, for Brad... Uh, he's in the midst of the Lord inviting him to a deeper place. And for some of us, there's simply no other way to make sense of the crucible we find ourselves in. And this, this sounds like a nice, pat answer. You know, I mean, everything, uh, you, get, you say Jesus and you get the gold star, so to speak. <laughs> and with, with any hard times we go through, we want to say it's because we want to grow deeper with the Lord. And yet, uh, that is a very hard answer to come to when you're in the midst of it. And in fact, for some of us, it feels like God is very far away during these times. And yet, it seems as though one of the common learnings is that the Lord is inviting us into a new place of our relationship uh, with Him. The second thing that we can uh, learn through such times is that it's for the deepening of our character or the deepening of our person. Now, that too might sound like a nice answer. When... Uh, when we think of Willard's word, where Dallas Willard, where he says, you know, for many of us we pray for God to bless us, and yet uh, God is withholding his blessing perhaps because our character isn't ready to receive the full brunt of God's blessing. And he goes on to say that if, if, uh, if God said, okay, here it comes, I'm going to pour out my blessing, physically we could not withstand the pressure and the weight of God's blessing that he wants to give to us. So uh, it just may be that the reason you find yourself in a crucible time and a time of boundary and a time of disorientation is that God is about to bless you with something. But could it be that you or I just aren't at that place yet to be able to receive that sort of blessing? And you know, so sometimes we think of character issues as deep, dark things that we finally need to uh, 
kick out of the pen, so to speak. And sometimes it's not deep, dark things at all. But sometimes mm -hmm. it might be, for some of us, our character needs to be strengthened as we become persons of courage. Yeah. Or for some of us, we need to become more confident in our opinions and our perspectives. And the Lord is waiting for us uh, to step up a notch or two and be confident in what we see to be true. And for some of us, yeah. those are the kinds of uh, learnings that we find ourselves in. The third the, thing, the Randy the, with the, the Thomas in his book Crucibles of Leadership talks a lot, particularly in those reversal sorts of times of endurance is the word as you were talking that he says that he says endurance and imagination yeah, is what we're yeah. taught through these times of seeing them differently, but also you know basically uh, persevering in the midst right. of maybe not being able to answer those questions and such. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, uh, I'm, I'm 49 now. I've been a believer for about 30 years. And, uh, and I, I really thought that somehow this faith gig should get easier. And yet it really seems to be uh, one of my lessons is that of perseverance. Hmm. Uh, am I, how am I going to keep running when at times I can't see the finish line? Well, that's, yeah. that's a part of that whole character thing that might be a part of our learning. Yeah. The, third, the third significant learning that <clears throat> happens through, uh, call it crucible, boundary, disorienting time, whatever works for you, but it's that of closure and grieving. Now, uh, I could name person after person who uh, have, they've come out of a very hard time, uh, but you know what that hard time was 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and they are still lugging those backpacks around yeah. from those, uh, those things that happened decades ago. Yeah. And they haven't brought a sense of closure or grieving in an appropriate way to a certain segment of life that, that may or may not have been uh, all too good for them. Randy, can I just jump in right there? Yes, I, I, certainly. I think that's a really uh, uh, fascinating idea because there is this tension sometimes um, desiring to kind of work through the struggle but then being stuck. Um, you know, how do you help people who are stuck and, uh, hmm. you know, uh, that, that are just maybe are in that season but haven't worked through it? Uh, yet, I mean, what what are some maybe some keys? I don't know. I know I don't want to give all of because we're going to address some of that a little bit later. But um, just maybe touch on a, a couple sure. things that you think right now. Well, I I think the the one thing that comes to mind is if if you don't have somebody with you to process mm -hmm. some of those past backpacks, uh, those things that have been painful. Uh, I this sounds kind of fancy schmancy, but I don't think you will get on to the next place that you need to get onto. Uh, the other thing that is huge, and Clinton would say this over and over to us, uh, if you have an issue of forgiveness that is undealt with in your life, uh, you have to deal with that, or the Lord simply, uh, he would say this, would not pour out his blessing of what might be next for you. And I know that these two people I'm thinking of now, man, they're just... Uh, there's an unwillingness to forgive the wrong that, that was really done to them. And they're still trying to figure out uh, why it happened or uh, all that sort of thing. And so point being, if we don't have somebody to walk alongside us in this closure grieving time, if we don't have, uh, I, bet, I bet half to two-thirds of us in this call right now are dealing with an issue of forgiveness that is preventing us from moving on. Yeah. So let me uh, let me just bring up the fourth thing. Yeah. By the way, uh, friends here, uh, it's no secret that the three of us could ramble on about things forever, <laughs> and and think that we are just right where we need to be. You know. You know, it's uh, been great. Uh, we've we've gotten some wonderful kind of comments and uh, some things just interacting um, with what you're saying, and so. For instance, let me just read, working alongside or under the leadership of someone carrying a backpack is very difficult. Yeah. Uh, yeah, how do, you know, that's a great uh, comment there. You know, it is when, 
and we're having to deal with maybe uh, you know on a staff situation or we're we're having to submit to ourselves to someone who really uh, needs to go through that uh, mm -hmm. to encourage patients in that but yeah any any comment oh, yeah. on that yeah well so, some of us we yeah we work with people who we are dealing with other people's issues to be honest and and we know that because when we start poking at things, we get this reaction, and we're wondering, and where did that come from? Yeah. And it's a it's a very hard thing. And sometimes, because of our position within the organization, we might mirror a position that uh, the other person who may have caused the pain in that person's life. We mirror that position, so we have to be uh, sensitive and prayerful in this whole matter, but maybe we're the last ones to address that person, but maybe we can uh, somehow uh, suggest for that person that they seek help outside of what we can bring. Or, right. Uh, but it's a very delicate matter when you're dealing with this whole notion of uh, an, uh, a non-grieving or a non-closure sort of issue. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And we have to be tricky. It can be really tricky, too, that uh, we can be pretty self-deceived too, so uh, sometimes we can project. We have to be careful that <laughs> we're we're that person some sometimes, and uh, and we look around and I can blame all the situation that I'm in on someone else. Well, that's a if, it, if everyone's fault around me, that's a good sign that there might be something uh, unaddressed. Uh, the Lord might be inviting us, uh, inviting me into like you know, bumping into yourself a little bit. So, right. yeah. Randy, why, why don't you go on to that fourth yeah. one there? Yeah. Okay. Well, if you stop talking, I will. <laughs> <laughs> so the fourth one, expansion of influence. Now, for some folks, they are in a place where uh, they are being groomed toward the what's next. And uh, one person comes to mind named Janet. Now, I think Janet is in probably one of the fastest growing churches in North America. Uh, significant uh, position of responsibility, and yet for some reason for Janet, uh, there's this restlessness, and uh, she's noticing things within the system that she knows she could address, and so she's found herself becoming a little more critical, and uh, wonders what's wrong with me, and. Uh, We've chatted a few times, and I think, you know, I, I think what might be happening within you is that you are ready for a next step. And part of what gives me a clue to that is you keep bumping into things that you see could be better. Now, sometimes that's not the case, but for, for a number of us, when we head into a season of disorienting time, uh, it can be confusing because we see how we could get things done. We're not being allowed to get it done. And so we start to react within the system. And sometimes that can be a great clue that, you know, I think that sort of Janet type person is ready for another level of responsibility. And bless our hearts if we have uh, an ability to risk within our own organizations to say, you know, Janet, uh, this is risky as heck, but I need to give you uh, not just the keys to the Volkswagen Beetle, I need to give you the keys to uh, whatever the next big vehicle that comes to mind for you is. Maybe it's the yeah. Volkswagen Passat or, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, knowing that that could be risky, but uh, to trust that when we see somebody entering into a, a, a disorienting time, that they have potential, maybe they need to take another step. And for some, it might mean they actually need to leave the current place they're in in order to move on. Could, uh, let me just ask a quick question here, Randy. Um, you know, I was thinking about that in terms of our own leadership as leaders. Um, we see somebody maybe challenging our own leadership. We see them, maybe we don't take a defensive posture towards them, but we kind of welcome them and invite them to a, an expanded place. I don't, I don't know. You know, I, I was thinking yeah. about that, and well, too, that, uh, that we and, allow and if, them to develop. Yeah, and if, if we do that, we would be counted among those who are weird. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. 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 Okay, it seems like um, rare is the person who has this, the, the self-differentiation, the confidence, the belief 
uh, to be able to do that. Yeah. You know, um, another thing, just as a as a footnote to this whole expansion of influence, uh, Robert Thomas from the book Crucibles of Leadership would say that this whole notion of uh, expanding to a next step or a next place, uh, that we need to pay attention to those crucible times because within them they give us clues as to how we actually learn yeah, and uh, right. what might be beneficial for us in terms of helping us to get to that next place. Yeah. Now, uh, Brother Bobby Clinton, uh, who refers to these disorienting times as boundary times, he would often say this, get out of the boundary all that God has for you in the boundary before you get out of the boundary. Now, uh, if you say that three times with a southern accent, <laughs> you'll be close to how Bobby would say it in the classroom. But uh, another way to, to say what he's getting at there is what am I to learn? What am I to learn? And, uh, and if you find yourself in a disorienting time, uh, prayerfully, that's a question for you to sit with for some time. What is it that, that the Lord has for you to learn? I want to keep us moving a bit here, but, um, you know, I think um, out of that, uh, there is this sort of dark side to these disorienting times that, you know, I know that in many cases a root of bitterness or whatever can spring forward and if we're not careful. And so let's move to this last segment because I think that will address that to say how can we get the most out of these seasons but and how do we faithfully navigate these seasons of disorientation the the first one yeah the the first suggestion we would make is uh, the awareness factor now by the awareness factor we mean it is good news to know that these seasons of disorientation or boundary or, or crucible times if we can see them as heightened times of learning, just maybe they are normal for our formation. Yeah. And so it's, it's, uh, it's good news to know that I might be exactly where I need to be. So to come back to my horse, she is exactly where she needs to be. And it is a much better place for her. Now, she's not buying into that right now, but uh, over time, hopefully she will. So it's, yeah. it's a normal thing. We need to be aware of that. But because each of us are unique, we bring our own set of curricular circumstances that somehow God has a way of using all of that uh, mm -hmm. to move us along. Yeah. So if we can remember that these are heightened times of learning uh, uh, and see them as somewhat normative in our formation, we might be spot on with where we need to be. Now, if, if, if we get real honest with that, though, I have two friends that I'm thinking of who are dealing with significant issues of cancer. One of those two friends uh, may well pass away in the next six months. And, uh, and I can't for the life of me make heads or tails of that kind of a situation. But what helps me is to have an eternal perspective. So yeah. for some of our, our boundary times, uh, for some of us, they are leading us right into uh, the season of death. And yeah. uh, th that's a very complex matter, but uh, if this Christian thing is true, which we believe it to be true, we must hold on with an eternal perspective that even these things we can't make sense of, somehow God's in the process of making sense of it. So the awareness factor uh, can be good news for us. We might be right where we need to be. Can I, can I add something there, Randy, too? And even as you use the word eternal perspective, I, one of the things that's extremely helpful is to attach that perspective. I, I know I remember hearing that a good bit in Campus Crusade when in college, the eternal perspective. But attaching that to, uh, I think the Psalms, the Psalms are a great um, expression of an eternal perspective. And uh, so as you were sharing even just some of those friends you're, you're talking about, one thing you don't get in the Psalms is kind of this bumper sticker, Romans 8.28 uh, sort of thing that kind of puts the cap on how we're feeling or the questions we're asking. So this awareness factor is not a suck it up, God's going to do something with it, but it is, uh, it's filled with honesty, and, um, but also a, a hope that is profound. And I think that's what you're referring to even with this, right. that, uh, uh, and I don't know if we, 
learn those things apart from ourselves going through some serious disorientation. And then we begin to learn and, and trust. But that came to mind as you were talking. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yep, yeah, totally. Well, and um, the, the second thing that can help us navigate that actually can give hope, as Rob's talking about, is that of process, or for our Canadian brothers and sisters, process. <laughs> so three, this, this looks simple. It is simple, but it's a bit of a heavy uh, thing to go through when we're in the midst of it. How do we look backward? How do we look upward? How do we look forward? So by looking backward, if we're in a disorienting time, we need to go through a certain season of that time. And for some of us, these boundary times or, or disorienting times may last upward to two to five years. Uh, uh, if they start to last beyond that, and I think we kind of know, I'm trusting we know when we're in a season of boundary, our hope is that this ain't going to last forever, that there's a surprise that's coming. But in that time, if it's a two to five year period of time, there is a time in that time when we need to make sense of what happened. So who can help us grieve? Who can help us bring closure? Who can help us celebrate what happened in order to move on? And if we don't have a time of looking back, uh, we will be stunted in our, in our growth toward maturity. So I think of a friend uh, who, uh, couple friends, uh, a couple married couple with uh, Susan and myself, my wife and I, and uh, the the wife of this couple, we'll call her Sally, she uh, was going through a very difficult time with her, deep facing stuff in her past with her father. And it was one Christmas where uh, she came over, she just received a gift from her dad. And uh, at the same time with Sally, she was entering higher levels of responsibility as a leader herself, sharp cookie, very gifted. But she would often hesitate with her perspective or sharing what she believed needed to happen at her work context. Mm -hmm. So there was a hesitancy that was a bit, a bit uh, abnormal, maybe even annoying for some, because she was sharp. Well, uh, Sally came over with her husband, Fred, and uh, we put the fire on. And uh, she took this gift that she got from her dad. She didn't open it yet. And she said, I know I need to do something to grieve my past and to bring closure to the pain of my relationship with my father. And uh, she had just a, a bad father deal. Mm -hmm. And she took that gift and she threw it in the fire. And we all sat there with tears as we knew that was a holy moment for her to bring closure to that. Uh, now, i got to be honest, there was a an instinct in me to wonder what the heck was in the gift before she <laughs> threw it in the fire. <laughs> but I didn't go there. I just kind of let that be a moment for her. Uh, but how do we bring closure? Uh, and so we need to look back. The second thing we need to do is have a season of looking upward. Now, uh, to come back to this friend I met with a couple of weeks ago, sharp guy, very influential, but he's, he knows the Lord is inviting him to draw closer. He also knows that his disciplines, now he doesn't do this, but the disciplines of his spiritual diet uh, being made up of things like, uh, uh, oh, now I forgot the name of it, uh, the Our Daily Bread sort of thing, yeah. uh, is not going to cut it for him. He knows that God yeah. is wooing him uh, closer. So he knows it's going to take a different sort of discipline for him. Uh, so he's entering a season of a new sort of looking upward. And for all of us, uh, I think the Lord is inviting us toward uh, places of continual looking upward, uh, especially as we go through these particular seasons. The yeah. third, third um, movement of, or process that we need to be aware of uh, is only after we've looked back, only after we've had a season of looking upward, can we then look forward and begin to process and look at the options or hopes of what's next. And that really leads into the third uh, way that we can navigate through seasons of disorienting times is that of community. Uh, we will be dead in the water if we try to go through these times alone. We need people who are walking alongside us. We need the sorts of folks who might be the senior saints in our local church communities who uh, just have a way of making space for us. 
so who are those sorts of, uh, I'll call them normal Normans, that can come <laughs> alongside us and care for us. But we also might need people who are a little more sophisticated in their ability to listen to us. So who are the yeah. spiritual directors that we could go to? And the longer you go through a journey as a, as a, as a leader in a Christian sense, uh, the more we need people who are gifted at paying attention to our souls and help us not be fooled by ourselves. Right. The, the third uh, sort of uh, a group or a category that, we, that might help us in terms of community uh, uh, or who are the people who might be just a community of friends or it might be a places like the Fair Havens in Vernon, BC in Canada where they they provide lodging and counseling or the link cares in Northern California uh, or other places that they're given to a, a careful caring of people who are perhaps a little further down the road as a Christian leader. Yeah. So uh, now what I what I want to do with this community slide is also challenge you when you're looking for such people, uh, this might sound like a bit of a consumer report sort of thing, you need to be asking the question, how are they providing me hope? So do they come with a developmental awareness? Now, again, to come back to that awareness factor, if somebody can help me understand that I might be right where I need to be, uh, that can provide a significant hope. So do those people we go to uh, know how to do that for us? Uh, secondly, do they provide a holy kind of listening? And by holy, I mean they are certainly listening with a, a sense of the Spirit and for the work of the Spirit, but they are listening to the whole of us. So they have a way of noting us physically. Is there something going on with our lives? Uh, could it be that we simply need to regain the habit, and I'll call it the spiritual discipline of exercise, physical exercise? Are, there, are they listening to the whole of our lives? And third, are they gifted at providing timely questions that uh, are like unlocking these gates for us to get to new places we need to get to. But not only asking us questions, do they have a way of surfacing the questions we know we have within that need to come forth? Yeah. For, for some of us, we need somebody to make a space for us so we can give articulations to the questions of our lives. So who are those sorts of people who can provide questions in that regard. And, and as, as I would encourage all of us, and I'm speaking to myself here too, uh, what can help us navigate through such times? Uh, do we have an awareness factor? Do we have a process or a process we're grabbing hold of? And do we have community that is able to walk alongside us through this time? And yeah. uh, so... Yes, certainly, Randy, the <clears throat> the the thought that comes to mind even as you uh, talk about that community at the end is certainly the the best predictor if we're walking with people and noticing that they're going through these times the the best predictor for not doing this well is isolation if right. if they are trying to do this on their own or people sense that they're walking into a whether it's a new territory sort of experience uh, unfamiliarity um, who who uh, we, you know, we do not know enough about ourselves to be able to figure this whole thing out, and uh, or Jesus for that matter. We <laughs> so there, that isolation. If you're a developer of people, um, it, it's looking at those uh, me, that perspective. Even in my own journey, I think as we kind of transition here, I uh, just jump in. I, I wanted to go, kind of go build Brian. On, build on that theme. There, we had a question that came in, and and I think that this kind of speaks to that maybe a sense of isolation, but it, it was about uh, two spouses um, that are in different places in their journey. And how do you navigate that where they, they're seeing um, maybe the answers are very different and uh, maybe they're, they're grieving different ways or, you know, they're different places and they're not in the same place in the journey. Uh, how do you, what, what might be a word of hope uh, for those uh, folks who yeah, even their closest relationships, they're not they're not in sync. And and how do you where might you they find trust and yet continue on in those relationships? I don't know. Uh, I would I would say Brian, the first thing that comes to mind is 
uh, how can each each spouse claim responsibility to to continue to become a growing person themselves and even if one spouse doesn't want to do that but the other does there's a greater likelihood of their system getting healthier if even one person takes responsibility for uh, taking steps to finding their way so to speak and that might be friendship it might be spiritual direction uh, it could be for some I mean, we've had a number of folks who have gone through the emerging journey process and for them as a married couple uh, it has been a catalyst for some significant change uh, but then I would I would I mean I'm always an advocate of uh, we are not clever enough on our own so how do we how do we find counselors directors as a couple that, and friendships that we can go to and help help us navigate things they can be honest with us yeah yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely uh, let me uh, uh, I think, you know, well, obviously we're kind of slipping into this Q&A a bit. We're going to get to that hopefully yeah. a little bit at the end, too. But there is a good question here, um, just a practical question. As we, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, people who can provide good questions to us. Um, what might be some of those kinds of questions that we might ask? I'm thinking from a leader's perspective, are there some key prompts that you might use, Randy or, or Rob? Um, in a person's life if you're you're talking with them I, I think for me I, I always enter such times prayerfully so if you're if the question is coming in terms of I I love to walk alongside others but I struggle at times to know the right question uh, as I'm in a conversation with somebody for me uh, it might even border on not listening to be honest I am praying my socks off that I'm hearing uh, what I need to hear and trusting a, a question will emerge when yeah. I'm trying to find one uh, and I, I also have kind of a default uh, three three uh, defaults that I ask is uh, and it's a general question but uh, where has this person been so where have they been uh, where are they now what are the issues now they're facing and when I ask them where where they feel they need to go or an, an, a way to ask that great question you can get a lot of mileage out of is this one if you could wave your magic wand and make the situation the way you think it needs to be what would it look like and tell you what I bet eight out of ten times people know uh, in quotes the right answers uh, that they need to pursue uh, but for whatever reason they've not confessed those right answers out loud and so so my role is simply helping them be more confident in what they know to be true so where have they been where are they now and uh, if they could wave their magic wand uh, what would it look like down the road so to speak yeah thanks brother Rob yeah you know, well I, the thought that comes to mind as you're I mean those are excellent too I, I think I the question that comes to mind in those situations and so many of these situations are different so it's hard to know but the, the I really want to create a space uh, a non-anxious space myself included uh, in which they can hear the where are you question of God in the garden uh, Genesis 3 and uh, I think for so many folks we are in such a hurry to get out of it um, that sometimes it, I, my experience is to to slow people down uh, in that, and even if they don't have a, a exact answer for where they are, um, uh, you know that awareness factor. Like, or are they? Is all their anxiety being? I need to figure this out now. This is a puzzle, or this is a map in which I need to take the right turn. Like sometimes the anxiety to to hurry through or to get out. Um, it's some of that that we want to help relax, uh, and that that's not one conversation. That that's a, a presence. But if I'm not comfortable with the ambiguity, I'm not going to be able to do that for somebody else. Right. Um, yeah. And if it, uh, there's no technique I can do to ask the right question, if I am uncomfortable with uh, the Psalms, for example, and the the way the honesty comes in. I mean, I need to address that uh, because I may just add more anxiety 
to the whole situation um, and then try to find some sort of answer that quells my anxiety, ignoring the person that's sitting in front of me. So um, that comes to mind uh, in addition to the things Randy's saying, uh, that comes to my mind. So yeah, I'm wondering if we could uh, just take a couple more questions and right here and then we'll wrap sure. up our, our time with this Walter Brueggemann quote but, okay. um, and, and maybe uh, just the last couple of slides. But there's uh, a question that came in. Earlier you spoke of forgiveness as being a key for closure. How do you process forgiveness when the issues and concerns are more institutional than personal? Maybe you um, wrong by oh. an institution. Uh, uh, you know, I, the, the, um, so here's a place where it would be great to be in person and have coffee, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> I think uh, the one thing that comes to mind is I think as we, uh, as we uh, grow or mature or simply just get older, I think one of the questions that confronts us in our vocational life is does, the, does my personal value and what I, what I hold dear align with this place I've worked with for some time? And for for some of us, it might even be allowing us to do what we feel called to do. But the organization, the way they do things, the way they treat people, the way they've treated me, by virtue of how the thing is set up, and it might be personnel policies, organizational structural things, does not allow me to soar and be who I am from a value base. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that throws us into either a time of suspension, uh, at a time of new territory, it brings us to a whole a confronting question, do I still belong here or is it time for me to consider moving on? So the one example I used earlier, uh, that was the case. It was, a, it was an organizational issue and in some parts structural issue that prevented this person from being all that they needed to be. And it was harboring a bitterness and uh, she's faced with a choice. Yeah, in fact, one of the questions that came in was, how do you know if you need to stay in the place or position of difficulty? <clears throat> if you need to make a change in the place you lead, could it be that this crucible is not ending because God is needing you to make a change? So it kind of, uh, I think, maybe answered his own question. But, yeah, any any other response to that? Uh, I, I would say um, uh, Parker Palmer uh, has a great prescription for all of us, I think in such situations, but in others too, where we have what he calls this uh, a clearness committee, mm -hmm. where, where we bring people who know us well, might know the context well. We come in a room with them, if there's three or five of them, uh, we sit in the middle of them, so to speak, and we start rambling, and we ask them to be honest with us instead of nice, and tell us what they hear. And what do they hear collectively, prayerfully, for such decisions that we might need to make? And sometimes this whole notion of suspension, uh, we might need to enter a discipline, a spiritual discipline of suspension, where we force ourselves not to make a decision for the next six-month period of time or the next year period of time just to see how things pan out and to see what sort of uh, confirming sorts of wisdom we get as we read scripture, as we interact with our friends, uh, as we touch base with our clearness committee, uh, our life circumstances, and so on. Yeah. yeah, that's a good word. We need to be wrapping up our time here, but uh, Rob, would you kind of wrap this this uh, this time up with this quote and uh, maybe sure. move to oh. some of these other slides as well? Sure. The, the, uh, Words, and, and I, we would highly recommend this, but the words of Brueggemann, I think, point to the awareness factor. <clears throat> he writes uh, about the Psalms, what is promised in the covenant is not equilibrium, but faithfulness. The Bible is realistic in knowing that life does not consist in pleasant growth to well-being, but it consists in painful wrenchings and surprising gifts. And over none of these do we preside. And uh, so there's both a theological and a psychological element uh, both to his writing here, uh, as well as to um, what we're talking about. Like, uh, God's sovereignty is one of the central learnings that affects both the way we lead and learn. And um, I think his words, you know, 
the words there is such a hurdle for so many of us that we don't, as Randy talked about it, we don't recognize that uh, we may not have taken a wrong turn. That metaphor may not work well. Uh, it may be that we're being invited in the midst of this disorienting time um, to look differently at who God is and who we are and what God might be inviting us to do. And uh, so I'll stop rambling there, but a couple, and then I'll turn it over to you, Brian. Uh, two books here, uh, highly recommend, three, up, one upcoming. Crucibles of Leadership is one we referred to a number of different times, and um, just uh, a good, an excellent read um, by Robert Thomas, uh, a process about learning to lead and learning to learn, uh, and how we leverage our experience uh, as being the teacher. And then the Spirituality of the Psalms, very small book, maybe 70 pages long, uh, absolutely gold in inviting us into the Psalms. If you're at all in a period of time of disorientation or you walk with someone, uh, my encouragement to you would be is walk with the Psalms. And then uh, next fall, we, we thought we'd add that. There'll be a book coming out that some of these thoughts will be a in a chapter, and it is Deep Mentoring, Guiding Others on Their Leadership Journey that Randy and myself have worked on. Uh, so that'll be released in August, September of 2012. Um, yeah. Yeah, which is a great uh, segue, I think, into some next steps that we would encourage you. Um, it it uh, is such a rich topic, and there's so many things that we could delve into here. But uh, we would encourage you uh, for some next steps. You'll be receiving an email in the next day or so that will link you, uh, send a link to our website, and you could download a chapter from Randy and Rob's book there. Uh, we'd encourage you to do that. You can also sign up for our next webinar if uh, this was uh, something that was meaningful for, for you. I think the next one is February 2nd. And um, also, I guess, just uh, from a standpoint of your ministry and your ministry context, we would, we would invite you to, um, to explore Vantage Point 3, some of the processes that we have, and particularly the emerging journey, where we invite people really to do all of those things of, of looking back, uh, looking upward and, and looking towards the future and what, what does God have uh, for you. And those, those three questions, who is God, who am I, and what does God desire to do through me, um, I think it, it might be an excellent opportunity for you to, to see how that might be implemented in your context, and we would love to help you do that. Also, we're fairly new to this kind of technology and media, but we do have a Facebook page and a Twitter account, and uh, if you'd like to follow us that way, We'd love to uh, have you there. And we have a blog, and about two or three times a week we try to send out a, a, something that's on our minds, something that we're wrestling with as well. But uh, you can stay connected in that way. Also, just uh, the last uh, slide here is uh, our web page, a phone number, our emails. If you have um, in any way want to make connection with us, we would love to uh, 